If you want to pump your body and expand your mind, there's only one place to go. Mind Pump. Mind Pump. With your hosts, Sal Stefano, Adam Schaefer, and Justin Andrews. What is this? I, it seems like most libertarians that we keep meeting are buff. What's the deal with that? Is Sal, is there a correlation between uh, political views and muscle? Actually, you know what's funny? They did, do, <laughs> they, they did do some studies on that. I don't know how accurate they are, but here's what I do think. So uh, Matt, uh, Matt Kibbe, I've, I've seen him many times on interviews and stuff talking about libertarian ideas or other, uh, a.k.a. classical liberal ideas, you know, free markets free choice, you know, do what you want, just as long as you don't hurt anybody, don't steal from anybody, that kind of stuff. I've been hearing him, uh, you know, talk about these things for a while. And I've also been in fitness for a while. And I noticed that people in the fitness community, a greater percentage of them versus the regular pop- populace tends to subscribe to a lot of these ideas. And I was talking to Matt off air, you know, what he sees, you know, what he sees in that, because as you, as as the audience will hear in this episode, you know Matt is good friends with Greg Glassman from CrossFit, mm-hmm. and it's not because they do CrossFit together; it's because of these this other stuff that we're talking about. And he said he noticed the same thing. And I think I said, "Do you think it's because people who are into working out and the nutrition they take that philosophy of personal responsibility, like I'm going to take care of myself. I don't want mm-hmm. anybody else to take care do of you me." Know what I and was, he says, "Yeah, he's, that's yeah, what he thinks make, too." It does make sense. I was trying to figure out what is, what was it about him that I really liked, and I think what I put together, and, and as I'm sitting there listening to him, he's kind of got this like very even kill monotone monotone voice that you guys are going to hear he's in this very episode. Very chill, right? But I think what that is is I think he does that intentionally and mm-hmm. has trained himself to do that in a very emotionally charged field you know what i'm saying yeah. like i think most people he deals with like you see him on hardball you see him on bill mart you see him on some of these ch- these channels that the guys that are the host are just oh. raw flam very very flam- flamboyant right or like just loud and inflama- like, inflammatory it's right? on They're- the delivery right like so i remember him kind of like talking about that on some level it's just like if he were to be like super emotional, like ha- have some kind of like uh, energy behind when he's delivering, like whatever stance he was taking, like it, it's going to go like somebody's going to tune out like real, real fast mm-hmm. or somebody's going to like, yeah, yeah, like subscribe to that. Like, and it's going to be very polarizing. So to, to kind of, you know, keep it a, a moderate kind of energy behind it, I think is a smart strategy. Yeah. So this, this episode is, it's not really a fitness episode. Um, Although we, we did, t- we got into CrossFit right out of the gate. We did. We talked about Because he's friends with Glassman, right? Yep. And, they, and he talked about how Glassman is trying to fight against this push to regulate, big, you big know, personal training and certifications big and big sugar's influence on government, you know, recommendations for health and nutrition, like the food pyramid and that kind of stuff. But we talked about all kinds of different things. We talked about some controversial topics like the gender pay gap. We talked about uh, liberty as a philosophy. We talked about free markets. Got into cryptocurrency. Talked about cryptocurrency. So it's a not. It's it's a it's a a little bit of a, a you know not necessarily a fitness based uh, podcast that we just recorded, but a very interesting one. And this is a gentleman that I've been reading his articles and stuff for a little while. I'm very happy to have him on the show. And um, I think. You'll enjoy some of it if you're not. Yeah, if you're uh, here just for health and fitness, obviously this is not an episode for you. We do do not dive deep into health and fitness whatsoever in this podcast. But those we've had so many people that love uh, the the conversations that we have outside of just fitness, and and mm-hmm. and I think that was what drove us in this direction. That hey, you know what? We've had such great feedback when we kind of go off topic of fitness, and mm-hmm. we and we have these conversations where we have healthy debates about these topics. So, you know, we wanted to reach out to some of the uh, professionals in these areas and, and have yeah, them on the show. It's just a nice change. Like, I mean, we're, our show is about like seeking truth in, in all things. And so I think that, you know, this is kind of a, just one small step to try to understand, you know, the political climate and where we are today. So absolutely. So um, without any further ado, you can hear us talking to Matt Kibbe. You can find him on Facebook, his he has a nonprofit organization called Free the People, so I suggest you go take a look at that. They've got some great videos and information, um, and really it's just Spell about- Spell Matt Kibbe, too. Uh, it's Matt, M-A-T-T, last name Kibbe, K-I-B-B-E. Um, so uh, that's it. Uh, here we are talking to Matt. Enjoy. My wife says I have a great face for radio. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's, that's what all our girls tell us. I, I don't know, man. The, the constant joke that keeps the, giving. The, right? the, yeah. the facial hair is like amazing. Yeah. You used yeah. to be clean shaven back in the day. Yeah, right. yeah now you right. got the... 
It's kind yeah. of the, the old timey stash. I didn't know you were like sleeved it. out, man. I had no idea you had uh, tattoos. Yeah, yeah. There's there's a story behind every one, and I'm I'm now trying to figure out what to do with this arm. So <laughs> you have no idea because right. I'll see you in interviews and stuff, and you usually you know dress so professional. Like yeah, this yeah. guy's got his. That's awesome. So you were asking us about. So you're friends with Greg Glassman in the, the yeah. CrossFit. You know that whole CrossFit, and you were asking us our opinions on it. You know, from a fitness standpoint, from a market standpoint, uh, what they're doing, I think, is pretty awesome. I know right now, if I'm not mistaken, he, Great Glassman and CrossFit, is trying to fight the this movement to regulate uh, certifications, right? Mm-hmm. Personal right. trainer certifications. So, what, what, what was his uh, uh, the deal with that? Well, the, you know, this is a this is a classic fight that that anybody that wants to start a business deals with. I mean, if you if you braid hair, now we're having a fight about people whether or not they need a thousand hours of training to blow dry hair. This is a real thing, no. and you know, certification is really an attempt by certain incumbent businesses to stop the uh, CrossFit and other trainers that have a, have a different philosophy. The philosophy that says I don't need a bunch of equipment. In, in my gym, I'm gonna I'm gonna teach people based on on, on my experiences and, and what I do, and Greg's fighting against that because his model and other other companies and and non companies that are that are doing fitness now, they they realize that a lot of what we were taught as kids about about fitness and about diet and about health is just wrong. So this is this is a classic in economics you call it a classic public choice problem where where incumbent businesses collude with with local governments, state governments. Um, the first place was in D.C., where they where they passed some of these certification laws, of course, because it's 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 crony capitalism <laughs> yeah. personified. And Greg fights against that, and he he argues that that the fight is really not just about incumbent um, um, gym companies, but but what he calls big sugar. And the the science of big sugar and the way that that soda companies have infiltrated um, government perceptions on diet and and the, the the what is it called the food food pyramid yeah the food pyramid yeah um, it's awful so <laughs> I, I just I, yeah it's all bullshit right but um, Greg's been willing to take it on and his his business is growing so yeah the the man's coming after him it's, how did you how did you first meet him how did you guys get connected. Uh, through libertarian circles, he he spoke uh, years ago in a, an event that I was at, and and he's quoting my favorite economist Frederick Hayek, and this guy's he's he's, a, he's an interesting guy, but he also just hates um, the the corruption that comes from from top down government. So I just love the attitude. Mm-hmm. So uh, can, can we let's give a because we have a lot of listeners who may not be familiar with the concept or the philosophy of you know, liberty, you said libertarian, like, what does that mean? What is the, the, the philosophy behind that? Yeah. And you know, the, you, you don't want to get too caught up in labels because I know people that would call themselves classical liberals. Liberal used to mean what we now sort of call libertarian, but, but libertarians made up word mm. because liberal started to mean something else. Um, I have constitutional conservative friends who, who believe that too, but me as a libertarian, I, I believe that people should be free to pursue their dreams and live their lives um, however they want, as long as they don't hurt people or take their stuff. And, it, and it's that simple. And from that, we, we have a general skepticism of government getting involved in too many things because government is legal, concentrated monopoly on power and power corrupts people. And I like to see democratized power and I love to see decentralized power. And I'm generally skeptical that that governments can solve all of the problems that they claim they want to solve for two reasons. One is because power corrupts and you get all these these perversions and, and you know, companies want to game the system and government employees want to game the system. But the other is more fundamental. Knowledge doesn't come from the top down. Knowledge is something that we all have a little bit of. And by working through the process of figuring stuff out, that's where we learn things. And th- th- this idea that anybody, um, a central planner, a president, a congressman, uh, a bureaucrat at the FDA, that, that they would know everything they needed to know to redesign some aspect of a market, some aspect of your life, that's insane. And it doesn't make any sense, and we all see that every day, that, that um, none of us know everything. 
And sometimes the best way to solve a problem is to get together with your friends and, and people that know things different than you and, and just say, what are we going to do? Let's mm. try something. Mm. This might fail. This might not. But that's to me, that's the ethos of, of libertarianism. And it's not, it's not so much anti-government, but it's, it's pro-cooperation. Um, and it's, it's, it's really enjoying the, the beautiful chaos of, of people figuring stuff out and pursuing happiness and, and living their lives. And in, in that sense, um, I, I think it's where most, certainly most Americans live. Now, yeah. were you, were, Matt, were you always a libertarian or did this some evolve in life? I mean, did you grow up born and raised this way? It's it's funny. I um, when I was 13 years old, I bought an album by a band called Rush. Oh God, yeah. my favorite. Yeah. And so many libertarians will tell this story. And and it's called 2112. A great album, badass album. And and it's dedicated to the genius of Ayn Rand. And she, of course, is a novelist. But as, at 13 years old, I'm like, who's this dude, Ayn Rand? <laughs> he had no idea. Um, but. I eventually stumbled across one of her novels, one called Anthem, and I just I just consumed all of her stuff, and and she introduced me to other libertarian thinkers, and so I was I was ruined at thirteen. I, I had no hope. <laughs> yeah. Now this is it's it's interesting when we talk about this because when I first talk to especially young people about the philosophies or the concept of liberty, um, I I find that I connect with them faster or initially when I talk about the moral. Uh, reasoning behind it. Like if I say to somebody, you own your body, you own your mind, you own what you own, your property, and nobody should ever have the right to force you to do anything to yourself or for anyone else, and nobody should ever have the right to take your stuff. And when I say it like that, everybody agrees, or at least the young people say, well, yeah, that makes lots of sense. I like that. But then when we go on the practical level, you talked about cooperation. I think it's important people understand that cooperation is voluntary. It's not. It has to be. It's not forced. And uh, that's that's a tough one pe to pe for people to understand, especially when we talk about things on a grand scale on, you know, like if we say, uh, you know, you talked about power and how power corrupts, you know, people might hear that and say, well, what about if a corporation gets big and powerful? Why doesn't that, why isn't that a problem? Why is it just government that's a problem? Well, I, th I think um, I think you should be skeptical of all concentrated power. You should be skeptical of big corporations too, but a lot of times you will see that the the corporations that do things that we generally are turned off by, that's usually in collusion with government. A lot of the reasons why big corporations are big is that they've been able to game the system and the rules so that the small upstarts can't get in into business and and we we're talking about certification and all that stuff it's a, it's a it's a classic example but that happens all the time if you can't afford to hire a guy to be your man in Washington then you're disadvantaged in the business world and it's it's a classic it's it's always the case that that the small businesses that make up the the heart of of America of the American economy um, they're always getting screwed by big corporations in collusion with big government. But yeah, I, I like democratized power. I, I think we should keep it as dispersed as possible. And some, you know, sometimes libertarians confuse corporate America with, with free market capitalism. Those are two different things. Corporate America quite often is, is, is built on relationships in DC instead of, of what they do for their customers. It, free market capitalism is all about serving customers and and creating things that customers didn't even know they need, like Steve Jobs did. Um, we we love entrepreneurship, and entrepreneurship is always breaking down the system and reinventing it. Um, governments don't like that. Yeah, many times uh, what happens is you'll have an emerging market, and it's very free because it's emerging. You can't regulate what you, what doesn't exist. Then it grows, and then the big players in that market now see that more competition's coming in, they want to limit competition, and those are the ones that come together to create the regulations. Like you talked about hair braiding or blow drying hair, you need to have so many hours. That regulation didn't exist when, the, when that was first coming out. It happened later on when you've got these big players like, no, 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 we, want, we don't want anybody being able to come in and compete with us because if I'm a business, I know more competition for all intents and purposes is bad. If, if I'm the only, you know, if, if it's just me and another guy, you know, who have a gym in a big city, I'm going to be able to get more business than if there's me and 15 other 
competitors. We're watching so, this happen right now with Uber. I mean, you see this with Uber. What are some companies, Matt, that you know that you see that are big disruptors? Well, the entire sharing economy is a classic example of what we're talking about. It's it's Uber and Lyft and the ride sharing. It's Airbnb. Um, but everything is being Uberized today. And in every single case, and think about think about what Uber does. It cuts out the middleman. Um, it, it breaks up the monopoly of, of taxi cabs in New York where you can't get a freaking cab. Um, and it allows um, people to be their own bosses. This is everything that we should agree with left, right, and center, but incumbents have come in and, and, and tried to break up that model because it's destroying a cash cow, which was the old taxi monopolies. Same thing with, with hotels and Airbnb. But from a, you know, from a libertarian perspective, all of that stuff is a brutally efficient allocation of scarce resources. You get an empty seat in your car and you're driving and you can fill that and make money for yourself and also maybe put a few less cars on the road. Um, but it's also what you know, the left calls uh, the sharing economy. We're, we're actually working together in cooperation. Um, and you know, there's, there's benefits to the environment, there's benefits to people that are trying to, to earn a little extra cash to, get, to, to pay for college, whatever it is. It's more freedom. And that's a good thing, but man, the, the the insiders are trying to take it down. Now, why we hear people say things like, you know, Uber's not regulated like taxis. It's not going to be a safe, or you know, uh, the drivers aren't going to be taken care of as much. They don't have benefits and stuff like that. Like, let's talk about that for a second. Um, is that true, or is that just? Um, well, it's it's true in the sense that there are more regulations on cabs, but it's it, it's making the assumption that that somehow regulations um, that govern cabs were written in the public interest, mm-hmm. when in fact regulations are almost always written by people with self-interest. We're all self-interested, right? And it doesn't change when you become a government agent. It doesn't change if you're lobbying the government to write regulations in a certain way. And, and you know, we used to call them cartels, but the old taxi regulation system was a cartel that drove up prices and made it difficult to get a cab. It made it get difficult to get a cab medallion. It made it difficult for um, young immigrants coming into this country that are looking for an entry-level job to get a job. And, and we want to break that all down. So I, I think this, this assumption that more regulation is in the public interest is, is a fundamental myth of, uh, about, quote-unquote, good government. No, it's not. Yeah, and the other thing, too, is it's assuming – if there isn't government regulation, that's assuming there is no regulation. I yeah. think there's, that's a massive mistake because Uber is very regulated. It's just regulated by the consumers. You know, Every time you get in a car, an Uber, and you leave, you rate it, and they rate you. And in fact, that's superior regulation because it's real time. So a cab can be terrible a, a, a lot more times before he gets found out than let's say an Uber where right away I can look at the last rating and be like, oh, this guy got a one. I think I'm going to pick somebody else. And that's why the quality, I don't know anybody that prefers taking a cab over an Uber. You know, we've all experienced both and Uber is just better. It's so more efficient. It's yeah. not only more yeah. efficient, it's better service. I get in the car and the guy gives mm-hmm. me water and he's got candy in the back and hey, do you want to plug in your phone? Cab's never done that. You know, never done that for, for me before. So it's it's superior. And Here's the thing I want to uh, kind of bring up with you, Matt, is, you know, we have so many clear historical examples of freedom versus non-freedom. And objectively speaking, speaking, freedom is superior. And there's no there's no debating this. We saw the fall of the Soviet Union. We see what socialism does in countries like Venezuela. And yet I just saw a a poll done uh, not that long ago that showed that college students had a more favorable view of socialism than they did of capitalism. Why? Like, yeah. what is going on here? Yeah, I've seen I've seen all of this polling, and on one level, it's it it sort of freaks you out. I was because, say, it's a little scary. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, what the hell's going on what here? Are they but, teaching these kids. Yeah. But I think you know part of it. Part of it is definitional because I, I I dug in. The Reason Foundation has done a lot of polling on on millennials and their attitudes about capitalism and socialism, and it's worth checking out. And they asked um, these these same, same young people that were saying socialism better, better than capitalism, do you believe that the government should own the means of production, which is the technical definition of socialism? And they're like, hell no, that's a stupid idea. 
So I think part of it is um, just not knowing if, you know, they, when they hear the word capitalism, they hear cronyism mm. and they, they grew up under big bank bailouts and they grew up watching corporations collude with government. So from their point of view, they don't they don't understand what we say when we use that word. And I'm not even a big fan of that word for that reason. It has so much baggage. When they hear the word socialism, they they don't think about the Soviet Union. Bernie Sanders very adamantly said, I'm not talking about the Soviet Union. I'm talking about Scandinavia. Um, when you ask them what socialism means to them, it means people working together from the bottom up to solve problems. And I'm like, that's not socialism. That's that's liberty. That's that's where the good stuff comes from. But when you ever whenever you give the government that much power, it's it's kind of shocking how quickly Venezuela went from the most wealthy country in Latin America just a few years ago mm -hmm. to a place where people are dying in the streets because they can't get food, they can't get medicine. And Nicolas Maduro is using that monopolized power, socialist power to crush any dissent. He doesn't care how many people die because he's about power. That's socialism in practice. But I think, I think a lot of young people are looking for that cooperative bottom up community where, where, where they can they can work together to help their neighbors and to to make sure that they they live in a good community, um, it, that never works if you're if you're if you're socializing power. Yeah, I, it's funny when Venezuela started going in that direction. You had some politicians and celebrities praising them. You know, Bernie Sanders, one of them. Oh, Venezuela is doing great things. You know, they're trying to, you know, help the people, and you know, this is going to be awesome. And now they're silent. You don't hear. Anything coming to their mouths about what's going on over there? What are some of the fundamental besides evil people with power? What are some of the fundamental reasons why socialism just doesn't work? Well, the the problem whenever you centralize anything, you 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 choose a winner and reject other ways of doing things. And I think that you know the the two mythologies of any form of of authoritarianism. And we could talk about fascism. We could talk about corporatism, socialism, communism, whatever label you want to give those, those isms, um, there's two assumptions that always apply. One is that we're going to find somebody that's good enough to wield all that power. They're not going to abuse it. Um, they're, they're, they're going to do the right thing with that. The other thing that they assume is that um, that person, whoever it is, is actually smart enough to redesign civil society from the top down. He's smart enough to to redesign the economy. He's smart enough to, to replace social institutions like, like churches and community centers with, with one top-down system. Mao, this is precisely what Mao Zedong tried to do in communist China. Which resulted in it, how many tens of millions of- It, it, was, it was the worst slaughter of, of humanity, in the, I think, in the history of, of civilization. He, he killed 45 million people in just a couple of years. It's it's breathtaking. Like wow. you, you take um, the Soviet Union and Mao's China, for instance, and you think about the body count. And I'm trying. I'm, I was trying to think of a way to illustrate just how how shocking this number is. You're talking about 100 million people. If you wrapped the globe head to toe, the corpses who died under socialism, you, you could almost wrap around the globe four times. That's how many people. Just these two experiments in socialism um, happened, and and part of it was abuse of power, but it was really more that arrogance that I'm I'm going to redesign how it is that that people feed themselves and how it is that they produce um, for the community. Now, Mao decided that farmers should produce steel, and this was his grand plan to beat the United States in in, in our economy, and as it turns out everybody starved mm -hmm. because you can't you can't it has to be bottom up and it has to be people figuring out how to solve these problems for themselves so it's it you know this isn't just socialism by the way you know fascism and other brands of authoritarianism to varying degrees they want to plan things from the top down and it's you know it's in the name of american greatness it's in the name of of equality whatever it is that that buzzword is um the opposite's true. It just doesn't work out the way they say. So I think people need to understand that whatever your intentions are, understand that that no one's smart enough to do this for us. We've got to figure it out for ourselves. Yeah, mm. to, to go deeper on that, 
my a couple uh, areas of learning for me that really m- helped me understand this was uh, I loved watching, you know, I did read Hayek and Mises, and I loved watching videos with Milton Friedman, and Learn Liberty has great videos, and they had this great uh, video explaining prices and why prices exist and what they actually reflect. And through watching that, I was able to understand that prices really are, they tell you so much about something that you don't, you don't realize. You just see a price of something, you think, oh, this costs $5. But what that's telling you is, it's telling you how much of that it, there's available, what the demand is. It's, it's helping allocate resources to make that particular product. It's telling all the producers of all the products that lead to making that product. It's, it's the most accurate way of communicating to individuals to allocate resources and to improve efficiency. And you know what I learned from all that was that wealth wasn't money. Money just represents wealth. Wealth is really more efficiency. And it's impossible. It is impossible for one man or a group of men or women to figure out the most efficient way to do everything all the time, even if they were to do surveys, those surveys aren't in real time. And if they were, you know, people buy things differently than what they say they're going to do. Like when you, those prices tell you so much about things that it makes things so much more efficient. I mean, the Soviet Union would have fields of wheat that would go rotten because of the inefficiencies in trying to plan where things go and what to do. So even though you may have great intentions, you end up starving a lot of people because it turns out figuring out how to control, you know, manage a, a a nation is <laughs> it's impossible to do without letting the people do it kind of themselves. And the other side of that is if you're this leader with this grand vision, not everybody's going to agree with you. What do you do with that? Mm-hmm. You know, what do you do when you tell everybody they have to do something? What you know, what would Mao do to the farmers who said, "I don't want to make steel." He killed them. Yeah. And that's the, what are your other options? You either force them out or you or they they move in and it kind of highlights this underlying uh you know it's almost like humans need this underlying philosophy and if if they follow the wrong philosophy we're capable of so, doing some some incredibly terrible things and socialism is just this it's just this wrong it's this wrong philosophy and it's it tends to promote these type of behaviors where you know, if people don't agree with me because I think I'm so right, we need to force them to agree with me. Why has it stayed around for so long then? What is it about That's it? That's a people, great question. Why 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 are people drawn to it still? I, I think I mean this I ask this question every day because it's it's precisely what I'm I'm trying to to hack the answer on this because it so obviously has failed again and again and again and and you can you can cite the body count. Um, but I think I think part of it is as if, if if we believe in liberty, one of the one of the failures has been ours. And I I was turned on to these ideas by Ayn Rand, and she she talks about selfishness as a virtue, and and sometimes we fall into this caricature that because you believe in liberty, you don't give a damn about anybody else, and it's it's all about you and and all that stuff. And we sound that way when we talk about um, the efficiency of markets and and all that stuff, but that's not really what liberty is all about. Liberty is about, yes, it's about pursuing your own dreams and, and, and choosing happiness as you see fit, but it's also that responsibility that we have. If, if you see a problem in your community, um, who's going to step up? Do you want to outsource that to a politician and let them, <laughs> let them solve that problem? People love to use that excuse, you know, mm-hmm. like, oh, my taxes are so high, the government's got it covered, you know, but that's, that should be our responsibility, and, and government corrupts that that sense of, of community that we all have. Is it we're lazy then? Well, is that what it is? Is it we're just <laughs> is it we're lazy yeah. that, and that and that it's just easier to let them handle it? I don't want to deal with it. Or are we scared? I, I I think it's all the above, and and I also think that that um, if you grew up with the government providing health care, you can't conceive of a world where mm. health care will mm. be provided. And by the way, it, it'll be cheaper and more available um, if we let if we let markets take care of those things. So, and you know, politicians for all of their um, weaknesses, they can always make an empty promise and it sounds so compelling. I'm going to give you free health care, and we're going to say in response, well, that's not gonna work and I'll tell you all the reasons it's not gonna work. Um, and we can't make a promise, but we can promise that, that together we can solve this problem. What's the main fear like people have towards, you know, libertarian ideas? Is it mainly like, 
like anarchism or like like some they feel like it's too chaotic like the ideas yeah there's always um um there's always qualifiers like well i i, I believe in freedom but maybe not when it comes to speech because people can say really hateful things and, and we shouldn't allow for that or i believe in freedom but everybody should have access to everyone should have health insurance um and, there, and there's always a qualifier but we need to do a better job explaining how it is that 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 free speech is a good thing, how it is that um, markets and patients and doctors working together and making choices is going to create a better healthcare system for everyone. And it's it's difficult because sometimes you can't point to a real life example because the government has monopolized the provision of, of something. Hmm. But then you have Ubers and things like that where you say, see, Prices There's went down, coming up, more yeah. people have jobs, and, and it's more efficient, and, and everybody wins. That we, we, we have to find those examples. I think, I mean, isn't Amazon, didn't Amazon partner with Berkshire and another investment group to create like a healthcare system yeah. with their own for Amazon? It's kind of like a free market approach to providing healthcare for their employees. Why is healthcare so expensive then? If, if I know people are thinking this, well, ours is more it's free market. Why is why is healthcare so terrible then in America or inexpensive? Well, of course, our our system has has never been um, free market. It's it's what we call a third party payment system, right? You have um, since the Great Depression, the government decided that um, there would be a preferential tax treatment to company provided healthcare plans. So right now for most people, you get your health insurance through your company. And that means that you want to pay as little as possible and you want to use as much as possible. And somebody at an insurance company or your 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 personnel office is is making decisions about what you can and can't have. There's no market there. And there's all sorts of of, of regulations and corruptions in that. And that's why Obamacare, the first thing Obamacare tried to do was force young, healthy people to buy this gold-plated insurance plan that they absolutely don't need. And they, by the way, they couldn't afford it either. It was called the individual mandate. And the idea was that you were going to subsidize the, the use of health care for other people by forcing people to buy something they didn't need. Uh, now, that's the, the individual mandate part, at least, has, has recently been repealed, but it makes no sense to do things that way. People need to make those decisions for themselves and young people in particular, they need to buy some, some very affordable catastrophic healthcare plan that says you're on your own unless you, you come down with, with some awful form of cancer or something that's going to be a catastrophic event in your life. And at that point, let's say it kicks in at $5,000 out of pocket, you're, you're covered. But everything else, you you don't need an insurance plan. You need you need to be able to save for the future so that you can take care of yourself. It's it's got to be um, it's got to be based on choice. It can't be based on someone else deciding for you what you need to do with your life. And if if you look if you look at the uh, the, the the sectors in the economy that go go nuts like insane inflation. Healthcare, education, education mm-hmm. are always at the top, like the, just skyrocketing. Those happen to be two of the most regulated um, government involved industries in the United States and the world. Yeah. Um, for markets to work well, you have to allow the signals to be accurate in the market. And what regulations can do and what government can do is they can skew the signal so terribly that the market then reads that signal and, and responds accordingly. So an example is education. If the government comes out and says, hey, higher education is, it's imperative, it's, impr- it's, it's super important, people need to have it, it's great, which is all, tr- can be true. But because we say that, now what we're going to do is we're going to make these laws that say, you, you have to give loans to this many people for school and we have to make it super easy to get money and we have to guarantee this money what ends up happening is you get lots of money that goes to lots of people. The risk isn't calculated properly because that's a signal. That's a market signal. And so now you've got all these people with all this money who are going to do a higher education. And the cost that means the cost of education now inflates because the market is reading that there's all this available money. It's no different than what happened to the housing crisis where you know, banks were giving out loans. 
partially because they had to and partially because they knew that there was no risk. Like, well, shit, you're giving me five grand to go gamble in Vegas. And if I lose it all, I'm going to get another five grand. Well, what am I going to do? I'm going to gamble every last penny of that. And so it inflates the price of everything so much. Because, and, the, and our answer is throw more money at it, give people more money. Whereas if it were more accurate, you wouldn't be able to get a massive student loan for a liberal arts degree or something else like that, where you, you're probably not going to end up earning it back. And uh, less money means the market has to compete better. There's going to be more opportunities and options, but people don't see that. What they see is less money, therefore less people are going to get you know the education. Especially today, which is crazy to me when we have access to so much free information online. Um, it's crazy to me that we even you know continue to make that case, but the more we're involved, the more we skew the market, and the more we blame capitalism versus what the real problem is, which is uh, you know our intrusion into the market. Um, let's talk about some some current events. We have a president who's in office now who is extremely polarizing, mm -hmm. and I know people who That's are. I don't think I know anybody on the left who likes him. I know some libertarians like some stuff about him. What are your views on Trump and what he's doing? I know he's cut a tremendous amount of regulations. Uh, I believe he's cut more regulations in the years and has been in office than Reagan did in the last in his last eight years or whatever or in, the, in his total eight years. Is that I mean, what do you think of Trump so far? Well, uh, just to to come clean, I, I supported Rand Paul in the presidential primary in the Republican Party, and when Rand pulled out of the race, I actually switched and supported Gary Johnson, and I was doing um, political work uh, for super PACs for both of those guys. So I I was I was not a Trump guy. By any means, and I'll, I'll say this first, I, I think one of the things that Trump has done that is probably a long-term service is he's he's punctured this this mythology of a romance with, with the presidency and this idea that if we just elect the right guy and he's a good family guy and and he he really cares about me, that's that's all I need to do. I need to elect the right guy and give him the power and 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 let it all go forward. Um there's there's nothing romantic about the Trump presidency. <laughs> he's a he's a he's he's kind of a he's kind of a shyster, and he 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 says what people want to hear, and then he'll say the opposite tomorrow. But let's be honest, haven't politicians always been doing this to right. us? Yeah, he's and, like the extreme version of it. Yeah, and didn't Barack Obama do the same thing? But man, he was so good that it like it he didn't, sounded so good. smooth. Yeah, yeah. It, it didn't sound like BS when Obama was doing it. But when Trump does it, you're like, okay, that guy's BSing me. But let's be honest, all politicians do that. So I think I think there's there's an upside to 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 sort of um, the hysteria that he's created on the left because I hope. <laughs> And and you're seeing this sometimes, at least they they've rediscovered the Bill of Rights, and they've rediscovered the separation of powers between the executive branch and the legislative branch. And when Obama was crossing those lines, they didn't seem to care that much. And and I think there's hypocrisy on both sides on this, by the way. Like when when a Democrat's in power, the Republicans are all about the Constitution and they they love the Fourth Amendment, and and state the, power, and all yeah. that. Yeah. And and now they're they're a little less concerned when when Trump does those things, um, so I, I think I think we should be skeptical of whoever's in office, and and I, w I would judge Trump the same way I judge Obama. Like I worked with with Barack Obama and the Justice Department on criminal justice reform. I think we're putting too many young nonviolent kids in jail, and I was willing to to work with those guys on that, even though I'd been a pretty harsh critic of of a lot of Obama's economic policies, my attitude with Trump is the same way. If you cry wolf every time Trump tweets something stupid, <laughs> I don't think we're gonna get a chance to mobilize people when he does something substantially wrong. And I think the left, mm. I've, I've, I work with a lot of uh, progressive friends on, on issues that we have in common, and I tell them every time, like you can't freak out every time Trump tweets because when he does something that we need to join arms and, and fight him against, everyone, everyone stopped listening at that point. Such a good point. Mm. It's a it's a uh, extremely good point. I mean, I'm not. Uh, there's some things Trump's done that I like. Some things that a lot of things he's done I don't like. I'm not. I didn't vote for him. I'm not a supporter. Um, but it's they are making it hard. They I constantly have to defend him, which I don't like. Yeah. 
Um, like, it's like, <laughs> make, like, make, like, please don't make it's me like have your to defend. Uncle, yeah, know, don't make me have to stuff. defend him all the time because you're attacking him on stupid shit. Like, attack him on the real stuff, not on the fact that he hurt your feelings. And really, there's this. I mean, what do you think? You talked about free speech um, earlier, and I don't. I mean. I, I love learning about history and I love, you know, reading about, you know, American history. And it just, it seems like speech is under attack today in a different and scary way, much more different and scary way than it ever was. I mean, college campuses like, you know, Berkeley, they used to fight for their ability to say whatever they wanted. And now, um, if you are a conservative or... We're in a red hat. Yeah, uh, yeah. Or you're wearing a, you know, Make America Great hat or you're a white, straight, you know, Christian male... Like they need to silence you and shut you up. Like, what's going on here with that? It's, I mean, I, it's so bizarre in campus that this this whole notion of safe safe spaces is is antithetical to everything that I think America stands for. Um, because you know, being uncomfortable and and failure and risk and all that stuff, and and being willing to let somebody that you fundamentally disagree with speak in public, those are all like core American values that that have somehow magically just in the last couple of years, it seems like these, these values have disappeared with, with young people. So you, you have that going on and and I'm hoping that that's, that's a cancer that that's on college campuses. And I, I think, I think the college campus model is, is probably dying out anyway because of the cost structure we were just talking about. It doesn't make any sense to spend a hundred grand for a, a, a degree in, 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 European medieval studies and then go work at Starbucks or even, or even business, which is a great degree to have because now you're just with the other millions of people that have the same degree. Well, like, (laughs) let's be honest. It'd be better to like, if you really wanted job training, go get a job. Yeah. Right. Um, Don't go get an MBA that, that teaches you the theory about how to create wealth. Go, go try to create wealth. But there's, I think, and that's probably part of, of why, um, this speech is 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 so under fire on college campuses because it's so weird inside there. But the countervailing force, of course, is social media and the democratization of knowledge. And and you know we mentioned Hayek earlier, and he he talked about the price system as a as a communications network. I would love to see him opine on on Facebook and social media and the way it it breaks up. Um, the Marxist professor cartel, the way it breaks up the mainstream media cartel. And I, I love, I love more speech. Um, I even love fake news because there is a kind of balance to fake news. Some, some blogger in their basement is, is calling out New York times when right. they do fake news. And, you know, we're so worried that that, that blogger in that basement is not qualified to be a, a news guy. Like, come on, this, it, let it, let it all work itself out mm. and, and there'll be more accountability when, when there are only three TV networks and Walter Cronkite, you guys aren't old enough, but he used to tell us that's the way it is. Mm-hmm. You get 20, not that's that the was, way how I feel. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You get like 20 minutes. That was his sign off, right? Every, yeah. every, every night, right? You get 20 minutes of news every night and it was curated by someone from the top down and Walter Cronkite said, that's the way it is. Well, you didn't have a chance to like tweet back and say, no, that, that's not it Bullshit. at all. Yeah. So I, I, I think we should embrace, like I call it beautiful chaos. Mm. Um, campuses are these safe places, but in the real world, there's plenty of speech and, and the more the better, even if, even if it upsets you, even, even if Donald Trump's tweet upsets you, it, it's better to have those arguments in public and, and work it out. I feel like he was a, he was a wrench. You know what I mean? I feel like yeah. it was just he was he was a response to to that that particular movement where people were kind of sick of it and so like, well, let's I feel like we always kind of do that to go far left, far right, far left, far right. I feel like yeah, we do this like ping, ping pong, pong match, yeah, yeah, back and forth all yeah. the time. You know, Sal brought up uh we we're talking about economics, the banking system. Matt, you're a person that I would love to ask your opinion uh if you have one on what's going on with cryptocurrencies. What's yeah. your thought on that? Yeah, it's like um first of all, like the you know, uh, Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies are all built on something called blockchain. And um, blockchain, I think, is is one of the most important revolutions in technology that we're only starting to see why that matters so much because it, it basically allows for people to securely 
contract with each other anonymously. Instantly, too. Instantly, without some third-party enforcement mechanism. So without courts, without governments, without contracts. And and that is that is so radical that I think people haven't even quite appreciated what that means. Uh, cryptocurrencies, um, the big problem with them right now is that the government's lashing back. And they've 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 really t- uh, Bitcoin has taken a beating, and I think I think it has more to do with the fact that governments are threatening to regulate it. Governments uh, like South Korea has apparently threatened to ban uh, Bitcoin. By the way, uh, Bitcoin is is a lifeline in Venezuela. If you if you want to earn a living or you want to trade goods, because their currency it's is, worth nothing is crap. Yeah. So you can't you can't get food imported, and they can't produce food inside. Mm-hmm. But you can use things like Bitcoin to um, trade with the outside world in a way that that is profoundly liberating. So I I think it's really mm-hmm. important. But government has a monopoly on money. It's going to be really interesting to see how this shakes out over yeah, the next five. And ten. they want to shut it down. But I'll tell you, my little my little nonprofit, Free the People, um, we've gone through two vendors so far to be able to accept. Bitcoin as, as, as an actual, um, organization. And I just got notice from the second vendor that we've, we use that they're not going to do it anymore because the regulation is too much. So they're starting to, to bleed the, um, this, this very robust, um, platform with, with nitpicking regulations. And, and it's because they don't like the competition. Like imagine if you can trade without using, U.S. dollars. It means that the Fed can't manipulate the price of that money. They can't manipulate the the price of credit. They can't bail out Wall Street. They can't fund the kind of debt that our current current government is funding. We're now like at twenty trillion dollars. You're fantastic. stripping them of the, the most power they potentially probably have. That right? is, yeah, I that's mean, all the power. So they're they're going to try to stop it. But this this is the the beautiful clash of our lifetime. The liberating forces of technology versus attempts by incumbents, including governments, to shut that down. Um, the, you, you read the protests in Iran. I, I just did a piece about this. Um, they, the, 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 the government in Iran, let's call them Islamo-fascists, whatever you want to call them. They're, they're just authoritarians. Um, they, they essentially shut down the internet. So the, but but they're, they're always, there's always a workaround. And every every you know they shut down WhatsApp, and then they then they use uh, virtual private networks instead, and it's like whack a mole. They're trying to stop people from being more free, mm-hmm. and it's very difficult in the internet age to do that. Yeah, it's like once the yeah. toothpaste is out of the tube. Yeah, you know, good luck. So what's what's going on over there then in, in Iran with this revolution? I've seen pictures of girls. You know, taking off their hijabs, and you know what's happening over there. Why is there? Why is this even happening? Uh, I think it's because of technology. There's there's always been. I think people inherently want to be free, and people inherently push against authoritarianism in all of its flavors. But back when the government controlled the flow of information, it was very difficult. Um, of course, people still wanted to be free, and you could look at Gandhi or Martin Luther King or Solidarity in Poland. There's always the pushback of people against authoritarianism. But now with with social media that stuff catches fire and you can create massive movements overnight when the government has, has, has overstepped its bounds. The response by the Iranian government is, is typical of authoritarians. They've, it's been brutal. And not only are they shutting down technology, but they're, but they're killing people. That's what they do. Um, but I think it's very difficult to keep a lid on freedom in our current age. And, and, I'm hoping that uh, that the gov- our government doesn't get too involved because I think that would be a mistake. I think I think that would actually undermine the people that are really looking for freedom in that country. Yeah, I think if we if we stepped in, what might end up happening is they might end up creating a kind of a common enemy. Like you know, the U.S. is why we're doing this, and and then everybody's against us, and it's no longer about them. And then which which just happened. Right, yeah, you know? happens all the time. We. Yeah. Uh, we bomb the shit out of some country and then say, well, no, we're helping, really. Yeah. It's true. wonder why that doesn't work. Yeah, I can't imagine. Yeah. <laughs> so is it, you know, we're talking about how people inherently don't like authoritarians, but then it seems like as societies prosper, as free 
societies prosper, then is it because people are spoiled and then they start to want to go in the opposite direction? I know, I know we've become less free. We used to be one of the top uh, five free, f- you know, countries in, in freedom on the, was it the Heritage Index, I think? And now we're like 15th or something like that. You yeah. see this in Europe as well. Why is that? Why do, we, why do we tend to try to go backwards? Is it because we just get spoiled and now all of a sudden we believe in the unicorn of government? Well, we're, we're spoiled, but we take certain things for granted. We, we take for granted the tremendous prosperity that we have and all of the choices and, and luxuries that we have that are unimaginable in Venezuela today. And so you find it, 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 does, it is a bit of a pendulum thing where people get so used to freedom that they forget where this stuff comes from. Mm. They don't know that it's because of freedom. They just assume it's there. Because when I was born, there was a Whole Foods on every corner. Mm. And, um, you know, I can get my latte exactly the way I want it. And, and that's my baseline understanding of what civil society is. <laughs> um, th- there isn't that stuff in Venezuela. You're, you're picking through garbage. And, and so you see the, the, the countervailing thirst for liberty quite often comes in authoritarian countries where they've seen what government's all about. I have friends in Lithuania who were, who were there when the Soviet Union would gun their parents down in the streets. They, they have no illusions about what big government's all about. Uh, we don't really see that as much in this country. We see it, we see it sometimes with um, you know, uh, mil- militarized police and, and the way that they handle crowds and stuff like that. And, and hopefully that's a, that's a teachable moment for people. But generally speaking, we don't see the government hurting people. Now, what about the arguments on uh, inequalities? I hear this all the time from the, um, you know, kind of the the, the far left, uh, which we'll call them, I don't know, uh, socialistic Democrats or, you know, whatever you want to call them. They will talk about uh, like income inequality and how a few people at the top have all the money and most people have, Mm -hmm. you know, less. Like, how do you, what what do we do about that? You know, I, I think um, we, we were talking about education and housing earlier, and one of the ironies of, of government policies that says everyone should own a home, everyone should have a college education. These are these are things that Barack Obama declared. Um, most people don't own homes, and most people don't go to college, which means that they are subsidizing the people that are now getting government loans to do these things. Think about it. It's a it's a taking from have-nots and giving it to to haves. That that usually is how redistribution of wealth works. It's not about um, uh, taking from billionaires. There's billionaires in Venezuela today. There's billionaires in every country, and they have the lawyers and the the the, the goons and whatever it takes to protect that money. And and they have accountants and they have a ability to protect their wealth. The The real problem when you get into wealth redistribution is screwing that 20-year-old kid that wants that first opportunity, that you always create that barrier and you do it through taxes, you do it through regulation, you do it through the minimum wage, you do it through um, forced unionism. And all of these things are, you know, that's the platform of, of we need to make things more equal, but that's not what happens. The opposite happens. And the, the only way to make things more equal is to allow people to be free to contract, free to take a job, free to, free to, to do job training, free to take an internship where they're not going to pay you anything because they're going to teach you something that's invaluable. Right. And, and we prevent all of these things in the name of equality. Yeah. And I also think there's this, uh, this common misconception that the economy is a fixed pie in which if I get more of that pie that means everybody else gets less but in reality the pie grows as market economies grow and then the other thing that i think is important for people to understand is if you have two people one man has a hundred thousand dollars another man has a thousand dollars and they both invest their money equally and they both grow their money at ten percent the guy with a hundred thousand dollars has now increased his wealth the same percentage wise but he's got way he got way more money because ten percent of a hundred grand is a lot more than ten percent of a thousand and money allows you to do that. There's also something I learned recently. Uh, 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 it's called a Pareto distribution. I don't know if you're familiar with this, but you see Pareto distributions in all creative 
in all creative markets, anything involving creativity. So like you'll notice that a very small percentage of scientists create most of the scientific literature. A very small percentage of painters create most of the valuable art. A very small percentage of musicians create the, the music that we all like. And a very small percentage of, you know, hardworking, conscientious, you know, intelligent individuals create the products that we want to buy. And that's a natural distribution that happens regardless, even if you try to force equality through socialism. I mean, in the, in the disparity in a country like North Korea is massive as well. I mean, you've got, it's supposed to be everybody's equal, but you've definitely got the haves and the have nots. It's just, it's done through political power. For me personally, I don't mind if someone has way more so long as it's the result of the fact that they're doing, that they've, they have, they're more intelligent, they work harder, and they're creating shit that people like. That's when I have no problem with it. And that's when I have no problem with that distribution. But people tend to not see that. And they see that there's haves and have nots. And it doesn't seem, you know, it doesn't seem fair. Is, uh, is that, do you, how do you feel about that? Is that natural? Is it natural that people are just going to be that way? I don't think anybody's equal anyway, no matter what. Uh, people are never going to be equal in outcome. And, and the, the, the goal of, of, of a decent government is, is to create an equality of opportunity. You don't, you don't want barriers to entry for, for someone that's trying to do better for themselves and their family. I just had a conversation with an Uber driver. He's an immigrant from Ethiopia, and he was, he was marveling at how easy it was to get something here, to get a job, to get an opportunity um, to even to uh, even to participate in the, in the military, he was the first thing he did is he came over and he signed up. Um, and we we take all that for granted, but you know, equality of outcomes. You, you could argue, say, for the political class in North Korea, things are incredibly equal in North Korea because everybody's starving. Um, everybody's starving in such horrific ways that that they've they've completely dehumanized and 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 beaten the life out of the population. The alternative is to have growth and opportunity. And yes, some people are going to get extremely wealthy if people are free to produce. But everybody has that opportunity. And and every nope, people don't starve in our country. And and again, we we take that as just the given. No, nobody should starve in this country. Mm. And I, I think we we also take for granted that people have different value systems. You know, um, I know a lot of people look at a CEO of a large company and think, oh, that lucky guy and or girl, and they don't, you know, they, they, they have all this money, but they don't realize that that person works, you know, a hundred hours a week. Yeah, what he sacrificed to get there. Yeah, it's just, you know, stressed out of their mind. Um, there's a reason why his job or her job pays so much money. Um, and people on an individual basis have different values. And then, you know, you can look at, you can break people up into categories. Like one of the biggest uh, you know, arguments that I hear that I've heard through in, in politics today is this this idea of this gender pay gap. Um, let's talk about that for a, for a second. W- what is the gender pay gap about, and is it because people are sexist against women? You know, uh, there's been a lot of studies, and they're conflicting studies, but the the gender pay gap is this is this theory that that women don't make the same amount of money for the same equal work that that men do, and it it fails to look at the life cycle. Of, of a career and the fact that, that women sometimes make different choices. Um, sometimes they want to take off 10, 15 years to have a family. Um, sometimes they want flexibility in their, in their job schedule. Um, and sometimes men want the same choices, but, but, you know, on average men are guys that, that go into the workforce and, and work their way up through a career and they don't, they don't take that time off. So I, I think it's, it's wrong to sort of lump people into categories, right? It's, it's not men versus women. It's everybody in the workforce making different choices for themselves about like, you know, most people don't want to work a hundred hours a week, but if, if you want to run a successful company, you work all the time. That's just the way it is. You don't have weekends. You don't have anything. Um, other people don't want to work more than 20 hours a week. And maybe their, their family situation allows that, that opportunity for them. I think it's a mistake for for us, you know, the, the 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 planners from the top deciding what's acceptable for people. Like 
we, we should do that. But, you know, the, the war against women was, was a narrative that the Democrats had, had ready and they've, they've used that card for, for most of my life actually. And they were going to use it long before Donald Trump came along and he just happened to be a a perfect target, particularly right target. (laughs) So just the right things. Yeah. Yeah. The thing, the, the, what I like to present to people when they bring that up to me is I look at things from an economic point of view and I think, okay, uh, I know that the number one uh, motivator or goal of a business is to create money. a profit, right? Which that's fine. It should be. And, and they should have to do that through serving the consumer. But if a company knew that it could save a full one fourth of its cost in, 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 you know, paying employees simply by just hiring women, that's all you would see right now. There would only women would be employed by a lot of companies because they pay women, you know, one fourth less than they pay men, but yet you don't see that. And that's because that's not, it doesn't exist. The reality is, you know, generally people tend to have, you know, men and women have different values and things that they value. But on an individual basis, if you compare individual to individual, exactly the same outcome, you'll see that there isn't one because the market uh, really, uh, it, it favors your productivity. That's like number one. Like everything else is, you know, comes second, third, fourth and all, but it's really about your productivity. And it's it's too bad that politics has is pushed so many narratives forward and really confused people. So we don't really know, you know, really, you know, what to believe. So yeah, my, my, my wife, my wife was here and she's a, she's a career girl. She's always um, wanted to work and that's been very high, highly valued in her life. She, she, her version of feminism says that, that we should all be treated the same in the workforce. And today feminism sometimes means the opposite where um, you, you want special treatment because of of your sex and if she was here she'd tell you that really screws women over if if you start creating all of these these special carve outs and and treatment for women we're not going to get hired for the same opportunities and that's just the perverse incentives that government creates and it sounds good it's well-intentioned but it 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 hurts women it doesn't hurt men it hurts women it does Let's talk about your, you were talking about your nonprofit organization. Would you mind uh, telling our audience a little bit about what, what that is and what it does and what you do? Sure. Um, our group's called Free the People, and we specifically set out a couple years ago to use technology and video and social media to turn young people onto liberty. And that's, it, it gets right at this conversation we're having about why are so many people romanced by the ideas of socialism. I don't, I don't think that, that millennials are inclined to, towards socialism at all. They don't like authority. They don't like top down. They don't want someone else controlling their lives. Um, but we need to translate economics and political theory into powerful storytelling. And that's, that's what we're, that's what we're trying to do. Uh, mostly short videos, but, but young people also consume a lot of, uh, documentary style, um, things on, on YouTube. They listen to podcasts. They, they just don't go to Walter Cronkite. They don't, <laughs> actually go to the Marxist professor. Um, they don't go to government. So how do, we, how do we make it more accessible for people to do that? And we drive a lot of traffic and we drive a lot of eyeballs and, and um, we, we partner with um, conservatives. I have a partnership with a conservative organization. I have a partnership with, with a number of progressive organizations. And, and I, that's because I think liberty is kind of in the middle today. Like we're not we're not ideologues in the sense that that we're going to choose one tribe and just hate the other tribe. We're we're trying to promote these values that I think think are common to all human beings. Which is pretty challenging when you look at like you, the advertising that's out there. When we talk about economics, and then when you look mm-hmm. at like political views, I mean those two those two areas are probably some of the most manipulated areas that we deal with. Like that's got to be such a challenge with the message that you guys have. It's all, it, mm-hmm. I have a burning hatred for clickbait, which, which, <laughs> which is really designed to just get you hating on people that you're preconceived to not like anyway. Um, so it, you know, it used to be scary pictures of Barack Obama and now it's scary pictures of Donald Trump, but you know, click like on that and, and you've, you've educated nobody about anything and, and you've, you've only deeper embedded that sort of tribal animosity that we feel right now. And I don't think that's 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 not who we are as people. And this is a downside of technology. But the upside would be um, let's let's seek out some common values. 
let's have a civil conversation. Let's, uh, let's, let's talk about things that we're not supposed to talk about, but let's, let's do it in a, in a decent way. Talk about some of the challenges that you've dealt with and with that, because that's something that, um, you know, a little bit of our history, like we were three guys that have been in fitness for between 15 to 20 years. And we're trying to disrupt the fitness industry, yeah. uh, calling out a lot of the bullshit that's out there because our entire career has been spent watching these companies market to insecurities, just like what you're saying right now with clickbait. So here we are now, and we've grown to be a pretty large company and trying to scale this business without using tactics like that is extremely difficult. Yeah. So what, what are some of the things you guys have come th- come to find out or what you're learning about this whole YouTube world and social media world and then mm. trying to navigate through it while also promoting a good message without using the same bullshit tactics? Yeah, yeah. So I, I think there's a huge market opportunity for people that don't do clickbait and it's a grossly underserved market and you you have to have enough enough faith in people that if you give them different ideas and you and you try to talk to them as as thoughtful people they're going to they're going to take that extra time to find you out and clickbait's always going to be there um, but but the alternative is is most of America. Um, most of America is more thoughtful than the clickbait. And, you know, when you read the, the troll comments on, on a Facebook post, like that is not representative of the people <laughs> that you want to talk to. So I, I think I think the other thing that we've been very aggressive about is experimentation and failure. And we, we throw almost anything against the wall. See what and, sticks. and we, you know, we do, we do heavy stuff on economics and we do corny stuff on um, just having fun and everything in between. Like we, we'll do we'll do devastating videos about the about the worst that humans can do against each other under socialism, and then we'll we'll um, make fun of of John Bolton's mustache, <laughs> and that's the whole gamut of things. But it's all designed to engage people, and you drop some Easter eggs in there where th- people see that and and they want to they want to learn more, and you have to have the the meat to back up the the, the engaging social videos and, and make it so that anybody can can self-educate on the things that you're trying to talk about. It's It feels to me a lot like the longer form content would do well with you guys. So like YouTube videos and also podcasts versus like hardball or one of the, can you describe like your experience with those types of shows where they don't really allow you to even express your ideas in full? Yeah, so I used to do uh, hardball a lot with with Chris Matthews. Oh, that's fun. <laughs> I saw that I was cringing. And there's there's one episode in particular that I remember because my 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 earphone was screwed up. So I, whenever I spoke, there was this echo that that echoed like three times. So it was impossible to talk back to him. But <laughs> when Chris Matthews starts yelling at you, you just, you just shut up and and, <laughs> and let him let him go. And and normally. And the reason I would do it so much is he would actually let you make your points. Mm. Uh, Bill Maher is the same way. I've, I've been on Bill Maher a bunch of times. And mm-hmm. and uh, as, as long as you can make your point, I, I think it's actually better to go on, quote, the enemy's show. I agree. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I've, I've never been, like, assaulted for being this, this crazy libertarian. People will come up in the airport once in a while and say um, something like, I saw you on Bill Maher and I disagree with everything you said. And I'm like, uh oh, here it comes. All right. <laughs> and but they usually go on and say, but I appreciate the the way that you explained your ideas and you really made me think about some things. And so I think I think tone, um, like when you when you're attacking the the uh, health industrial complex, um, tone probably matters. And and making sure that you know we we should have that right righteous indignation and rage against the machine about all the things that the establishment is doing wrong, but. But let's let's be conscious of, of of a tone that actually makes people want to listen to what you have to say. Hmm. You have a ver- you have a much a very positive. It feels like a positive outlook on you know how things are where they're moving forward, which is very different from the I guess the mood that you get from any other I don't know you know political commentator pundit or whatever where it's like doom and gloom. And it's funny listening to you, you know, you do make a lot of fantastic points. Like when I think about the the poll that I told you about um, with college students and, and socialism in the same, I mean, in the same sense or the same sentence, like millennials are more entrepreneurial than previous, previous generations. They actually value entrepreneurship. And I know I see we have yeah, some that work for us. 
And they're way more entrepreneur minded than previous generations. Like I talk to kids now and you ask them, what do you want to do when you grow up? And I'm getting things like, oh, I want to have a YouTube channel or I want to start a business on the internet. And it wasn't like that a couple generations ago. So I'm wondering if we just, because the loud, the extremes tend to be the loudest, that maybe we have this distorted view of what's, you know, what's really going on. Well, I, th- I think so. And I, th- I think language is so important. I, I, I have this, I mentioned I have this uh, working relationship with some progressive friends. And I, the first time I joined them in a closed door meeting, um, I realized that even though they were speaking perfect English, I really didn't understand what they were saying because their language was so tribal and they, mm. they have certain ways of saying things. Um, and I, I ended up telling them, as I'm, I'm trying to understand where you guys are coming from, but I don't even understand what you're talking about. Um, <laughs> And then I went back to one of my libertarian hangouts and I realized we do the same damn thing. <laughs> we, we Good got, awareness there. Yeah, we got all this this secret handshake stuff that we do. And so so listening what people to trying to figure out what people are actually trying to say, like like when young people say that they're interested in socialism, it's not enough that I mean that poll itself is kind of clickbaity, right? Mm-hmm. And it would be more interesting to actually have a follow-up conversation with people that are intrigued by socialism. Say, what are you looking for? What do you what do you think that you're trying to accomplish with with that word? And and you'll quite often find that they mean something fundamentally different than you mean. It's a it's a it's mm. a great point. I didn't even think of it that way. Um, when I look forward, I see things being more and more free, but not necessarily because the ideas of, of freedom were more popular more so because I think technology is kind of gonna is just kind of forcing it that way. Like I don't think I don't think government knows what to do with these emerging markets because they don't know what to regulate because they don't they just don't know. Like Uber, there's no way Uber would have existed had government officials known what it was going to be. Well, but, we've seen this in the marijuana in- industry too, not that long ago. I mean, I was a part of that whole movement here in the Bay Area. And I really believe what took so long is just government trying to figure out how they're going to get their hands of into it. <laughs> of course, right. It's like, why did it take this long? Well, let's let's allow some clubs so we can track stats and numbers and see exactly what it's producing, and then we'll figure out how we're going to get our hands. Acquire some patents, yeah. and then they make more, and then they have enough money to lobby and compete with the alcohol. And the irony, and the irony in it, if somebody who really understands economics realized too, we're not even solving the black market problem because. Then they, they put so many taxes uh, involved in it, it drives the the medical marijuana industry, the prices up, so there still is a black market that exists. So how shitty is that, that we have now have all these cannabis clubs and we're doing such a great thing, but yet we're still not getting rid of the black market because of all this fucking taxation that's gone inside of it? It's, an, it's unreal to me. Well, that was a dirty deal that, that um, we did um, with government and incumbents, uh, particularly you know, pharmaceutical companies, alcohol companies, those are the primary opponents in the state of Utah where they're trying to, to legalize medical cannabis on the ballot. Um, but we made this this deal. Like, you, you can tax the shit out of it if you let it be legal. You have to sign. You have to shake hands with them. You yeah. know? So that's and, bullshit. Yeah. And it's, and, and, but we'll work through that. I, th- I think we did need to get to market and show mm-hmm. that you know, children are not going to be dying in the streets because, because we legalized adult use of, of cannabis in Colorado and Washington and and now in California, I mean, I think it goes back to that problem. Like people need to see how the market's going to function mm-hmm. and it's going to be fine. And the demagoguery is going to go away once people see that it's okay. But yes, they're going to, they're going to push a lot of people into the black market because they're going to try to tax the shit out of it. And, and that's going to have to work itself out. Um, but you know, the, you know, Uber and, and Lyft and, and uh, the democratization of knowledge it, it all looks kind of chaotic right now. And, and think about like, you know, we, we got Donald Trump, we have Bernie Sanders, uh, we have all of these, these political movements all over the world that seem to be vacillating from extreme left to extreme right. And I, I, you could look at that and say, wow, this is all fucked up. Or you could say, wow, more people are enfranchised now and the, the two-party duopoly that used to give us, you know, two flavors of the same damn thing. <laughs> is being broken up and you're seeing that the, yeah, there, there's democratic socialists and they're, they're a substantial minority in this country. There's, there's libertarians, there's, there's, there's conservatives, there's all these different flavors of, of people's politics. And, and I think that is generally a, a good thing. We're, we're seeing more people with more voices 
Um, it's happening in the marketplace. It's happening in politics. And and this is why I'm optimistic about the long run of liberty, because I think, I think we have a pretty cool set of ideas that are consistent with with how people actually live and strive and, and achieve and 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 we sh- we just need to connect with a much bigger audience than we have in the past mm. it seems that way we have uh politicians now who actually call themselves uh libertarian rand paul is one of them he's got a decent amount of of of, uh, of pull and power justin amash is another gentleman that i like to follow quite a bit but you didn't have anybody before ron paul was the only one before and everybody you know they didn't really pay much attention to him Called him crazy, you know, crazy or whatever. Yeah, he's actually my. That's that's the first guy that I saw. I watched his videos at first, like man, I don't know how many years ago, and, and that was my kind of introduction into that. So yeah, Ron Paul used to be the only Liberty Republican out there, and and now I could I could rattle off a couple more. Uh, Thomas Massey in Kentucky Massey. is pretty awesome, and they're 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 interesting because they're they're viewed as Tea Party Republicans, and I was part of the Tea Party movement and. And now, which originally started off very it, w- it was it was a very liberty thing and then, um, then it got hijacked it's, it got it got hijacked and by the way politics corrupts everything so it's <laughs> it of, of course. course it would corrupt a social movement as well but but Justin Amash is is a ardent defender of, of free speech and privacy and all the things we've been talking about today but and and, and by the way of a, a probably one of the highest profile Republican critics of, of Donald Trump. But, you know, he was elected by by the Tea Party against the Republican establishment in his district. And they actually ran a candidate against him um, with with the most horrible attack ads. And they've tried to unseat him. But but he he's he's untouchable because politics has been democratized. He raises money outside of the party system. He organizes his his voters outside of the party system he uses things like Facebook to to communicate every vote he takes. He will give you yep, a, I follow him, a yeah. full explanation, which is great. Like that's that's precisely who we want to that's run cool. for office. Yeah. But you know his his party bosses hate him. His party bosses hate him, and sometimes he works with Democrats on on issues of of, of common interest. Um, as Thomas Massey said once, he, um, Someone asked him, why, why do you work with so many Democrats? And he said, well, Matt, you're confusing me for a partisan. I, <laughs> I'm an ideologue. I believe certain things. And if I can find someone else that believes those things, I'm going to work with them. And I don't care which party they belong to. Excellent. Are yeah. you uh, like a big L libertarian or a small L? Like, do you, are you a big party libertarian? Because um, par- yeah, the, there's actual political party libertarian. Yeah, I'm, I'm a smaller libertarian, and and, and I, there's a difference. Yeah, there's a, there is a difference, and you know, political parties are are vehicles to to try to accomplish some short term goal, and and they can be empty vessels. Like the Republican Party can be free trade one year and anti trade the next year. Same with the Democratic Party. Um, the first real involvement I had with the Big L Libertarian Party was in this last cycle. Um, because I, I I liked Gary Johnson compared to the other two choices we had on the ballot, um, they are struggling with uh, the growing pains of what it would take to be a major party, and some of that's internal. Like they're they they're constantly having fights about who's pure enough and and excommunicating anybody that's not pure enough. Yeah, didn't they say just recently that Ron Paul and and Judge Napolitano can't even speak at their? Yeah, I mean it. There, someone in the in the LP said that, and and they were they're debating back and forth. But but those are the kinds of little fights that that small parties have. Mm. Their bigger problem is that the the two party duopoly, the Republicans and the Democrats, colluded to keep Gary Johnson off the stage uh, in during the presidential debates. And based on the standards that Ross Perot used to get on the presidential stage, um, Gary should have been up there. But they change the rules because they're a cartel and they can change the rules and <laughs> wow. and they don't like competition. So a lot of the problems with third parties, not just the Libertarian Party, is that the two parties don't want them. Green Party has the same problem. Mm-hmm. And but you're seeing all of these dynamics that I described with with Justin Amash beating the party bosses. You're seeing the ability of of third parties to use social media 
to, to grow their ideas. I, I think personally, I think people should have more than two choices in politics. They're going to have to go that route or else the rock is going to be our next president. I mean, I feel like <laughs> if they don't get on fucking board with Facebook and start figuring this game out, uh, we're right. or destined for a celebrity to be our next fucking Followed president, right? Don't you? Yeah. I mean, that's, I, I'm predicting him right now, unless somebody else finally gets or it Oprah, together. If she yeah, ends up yeah, running. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oprah or the rock. I, between those two, I'm, I'm leaning rock. <laughs> <laughs> same, same that's what we here. said. So for someone who's just wants to start learning more about some of these ideas, uh, what's, what are good resources or places you think they should start looking? So uh, a couple of places, I mean, go check out our videos. Um, you find us on Facebook, uh, Free the People. Uh, find us on YouTube. We, you know, we publish all our videos there. We're primarily um, using Facebook just because that's where we've invested over the years. I like the Foundation for Economic Education, mm. and it's a crowdsourced platform for articles and stories about liberty. Uh, there's a lot of great stuff on there. I've always loved uh, Reason Magazine. Uh, John Stossel's doing some stuff with them right now. And, you know, if you want to dig deeper, um, go look at the, at the curriculum that, say, the Cato Institute might, might propose. But I, I just don't, I don't think you should start with, with a thousand page book that I tried to slog through. Um, start, start with a video, start with a story. Um, there's a guy named Glenn Jacobs who is Kane from WWE. Oh yeah, and he's a libertarian. Yeah, and, and Remember we Kane. Know that, of course, yeah, of yeah. course. I didn't know that. Yeah, um, and we did. We I did an interview with him. He is the most articulate explainer. Super the, intelligent of the difference between socialism and capitalism. So, so check that oh, out. Oh like, man, he'd be a fun interview then. Maybe we'll oh yeah, we should find him. Yeah, oh, for sure. Yeah, I liked it. the video I send people. Um, there's one video I send everybody when they when we start talking about these things, and it's uh, Milton Friedman, the pencil. He's describing it. It's a three minute video you can find on YouTube. Yeah, and it it's a very basic. Uh, in it, but very powerful illustration of as far as economics, the, is concerned. just the power of markets, and you know how they are drivers for peace, uh, and you know not what what people tend to think when they think crony capitalism. So yeah. it's my favorite thing to share. So anyway, thanks for coming on, man. Oh, this has been fun. Oh, yeah. Absolute yeah, yeah. blast. I'm glad that you're you're really the first person that we're bringing on the show that we're introducing. Like you know, one of, this is one of my passions in particular is. Uh, are the philosophies and ideals of, uh, of liberty and free markets. And you're the first person we brought on to talk about this with our audience. So thanks. Yeah. Thank we'll, you. We'll see how the comments turn. Yeah. <laughs> we'll, see. We'll, we'll let you know, Matt. Thank you for listening to Mind Pump. If your goal is to build and shape your body, dramatically improve your health and energy, and maximize your overall performance, check out our discounted RGB Super Bundle at mindpumpmedia.com. The RGB Super Bundle includes MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, and MAPS Aesthetic. Nine months of phased expert exercise programming designed by Sal, Adam, and Justin to systematically transform the way your body looks, feels, and performs. With detailed workout blueprints and over 200 videos, the RGB Super Bundle is like having Sal, Adam, and Justin as your own personal trainers, but at a fraction of the price. The RGB Super Bundle has a full 30-day money-back guarantee, and you can get it now plus other valuable free resources at mindpumpmedia.com. If you enjoy this show, please share the love by leaving us a five-star rating and review on iTunes and by introducing Mind Pump to your friends and family. We thank you for your support, and until next time, this is Mind Pump. <laughs>